That Naturopathic Podcast. TNP. Hello there. Hi, and thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. Cara Denisio. And I'm Dr. David Miller, and we hear your frustrations. This show is for you. This show is for you if you're feeling like your current healthcare strategy is not getting to the root cause or the underlying reasons for your health. This show is for you if you've been told that you're fine, but you definitely don't feel very well. This show is for you if you're walking out of your doctor's office with one, two, three, four, or even five medications without any mention of diet, lifestyle, or a long-term game plan. This show is for you if you've got several specialists taking care of you, but no one is really putting it all together. This show is for you if you believe that health should be part of health care. These problems have solutions. We know it. Our patients know it. And we want you to know it. Naturopathic medicine is the solution that you need to know about. Welcome to another episode of That Naturopathic Podcast. Dr. Kara here. Dr. Dave here. And we're really excited to have uh, a colleague of ours from BC, Dr. Taylor Bean. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Dr. Bean? Yeah, we, uh, we knew we wanted Dr. Bean on um, very early in our podcast, uh, Who Should We Interview list, because uh, Dr. Bean has a really cool uh, thing that you might not really think the naturopaths do. So Dr. Taylor Bean is, uh, is a really informed uh, practitioner on vaccinations. And so uh, she's got her clinical practice in British Columbia and we can tell you all of the ways you can find her by the end. But we're really excited because this is a conversation a lot of our patients ask us about. And we're going to the ND who gives vaccinations and is very informed on them. So thank you so much for joining us, Taylor. My pleasure. <laughs> so could you tell our listeners, first of all, they might be surprised that naturopathic doctors in British Columbia can give vaccinations. That's not the case where we are here in Ontario, and it's going to vary by jurisdiction. But can you just uh, walk our listeners through um, through how you got to be so informed um, on the topic, topic of vaccinations? Yes. Yeah, so um, being in British Columbia, we're very um, lucky to have such a wide scope. And as I understand, we're the only province in the entire country that can offer vaccines for our patients. The age is going to be from five years and older that we can offer them. So we cannot see, I have a lot of patients wonder why, and I'm not quite sure why, but um, the scope starts at five. But my journey of getting here has been an interesting one. It didn't happen overnight. Um, You know, in in going through, I went to Boucher uh, here in uh, outside of Vancouver and the learning of vaccines um, is, is pretty on par with medical doctors. You're going to learn about the infections. You're going to learn about with which vaccines help with those infections and the timing and the schedule that which you give them. And so I graduated not knowing much about vaccines and no interest in. Um, but when I, I moved overseas, uh, we moved to Dubai and then we moved to Singapore, which is where I started a practice. And in Singapore, there are mandated vaccines and um, which include measles and diphtheria. So those two have to be given no matter what. And so in my, in my practice, it, you know, working with families, there is no option at all if you're going to vaccinate or not. You do. And so I had families that um, either wanted to, to work on um, making the vaccine more effective or if there's anything to know about what to do afterwards. I had no idea at that point what that meant. Um, I'm just using naturopathic principles, supporting the the whole body as a whole. Now, when I was there, I had on two different occasions, I had uh, two moms that came in and they wanted to speak to me because their child had had a vaccine reaction and meaning, you know, they had received the vaccine and they, there's the certain things were different with them, and, and they had seen their GPs. They had been referred to their neurologist or maybe, um, uh, you know, other specialists. And, and so, within Singapore, it's very easy to see um, specialists within the country very quickly. And no one was giving them any answers. And when they came to see me, they weren't wanting a discussion if it was the vaccine or not. It was more of you're a naturopathic doctor. And I want you to tell me on, on how I can support my child now. And being a new grad, I 
didn't know what I was dealing with. I didn't understand vaccines. And so I, I didn't know or have or any tools in my pocket that I knew that could help them because I didn't know what I was dealing with. And when you're a new grad, you know, you think you could fix everything and you, it really hits you where part of like, I want to be able to fix you, but I don't know how to fix you. And there was a bit of embarrassment that came um, in, in, from me and that I didn't have an answer. And so that really propelled me forward to know, well, if I'm going to stay in Singapore, I live in Singapore, I, I should know what the answer is. I should know what I'm talking about. And I don't know what I'm talking about. So that um, I started my journey in quest of understanding vaccines. We moved from, from Singapore and, and came back to Canada. I've been here for four years now. And when we moved back to Canada, the option of taking the um, immunization course was there. So I took it. I wanted to understand more. And um, I wanted vaccines to be more so a part of my practice so that I would have those answers for patients, for patients that are going to be doing vaccines. Um, and I could offer them and have that more controlled environment as well. Um, being only able to vaccinate children five years and older um, certainly limits my demographics, but I have had people who booster shots, um, to I had one patient, he had full ride scholarship um, to New York State and was unvaccinated and needed his vaccine. So we did them through myself. And, you know, along this journey um, of learning vaccines, of course, people then understand that I'm learning about vaccines, offer vaccines, and want to come in to, you know, they have a lot of questions. And so the trend that I've seen throughout this process, which has become more of a reason why I continue and maintain offering vaccines is the the real ability to start answering those tough questions. And I really want to be a place of a safe place to land for people to come in to ask those questions. Because if you don't feel safe, you're not going to ask those questions and you're probably not going to do what you may should do, be doing. You know, so hearing those, you know, story after story of parents who, you know, they they go into their public health office and they, they ask a question and either the question is pushed aside or, you know, they don't know the answer or there is a sensation and a, and a different emotional boundary that starts happening. And that's very uncomfortable for people. And so then they just avoid it completely because no one is answering their questions. And then you go to the internet and internet has some good answers, but it may not have the right answers. And so, um, I have seen, you know, other people helping people on Facebook forums and, you know, from either side that you're on, I've seen the, the wrong answers from either side. And, um, you know, and, and of course, even the, the energy around it is very polarizing. There's a lot of anger, there's a lot of fear. And so what I want to try to do is really cut through that emotion, be unbiased about this conversation and just have a conversation about it. And we should be able to ask questions. We should be able to receive the answer and um, in a way that's very respectful, um, mindful of the person that we're speaking to. Because if you're a brand new mother who has, who's almost two months for your two month vaccinations and you just are, you're getting, you know, bombarded from your parents, your friends, the internet, and you, you have no idea where to start. And there it's the fear is building up from both sides. I mean, that's a really uncomfortable place to be in. And so I haven't, I don't know many people that, that allow for that safe landing. And so I'm really trying to build that part of my practice is to allow for that conversation um, because informed consent in anything we do is very, very important. And I learned that very quickly just in my own experience as a mother and birthing, that informed consent around the birthing aspect and I've applied that to everything and more so with vaccines because I feel that it's a, it's a, it's a lacking place. Um, so that's been my, my journey getting here and it's just been growing exponentially and my learning is growing and I've been very fortunate to be able to bring the information to the stage as well. Um, you know, speaking to my own colleagues at two different conferences and I will be in Toronto to speak there as well. Knowing that naturopathic doctors um, in Ontario are very limited to what they can say, that's okay. Um, that's fine as how it is. I think what's important is as physicians is for you yourselves to understand 
the product that which your patients are dealing with. And if, if they need support before or after, then you can apply that, not to do with a vaccine, but supporting the body in itself. I, uh, I wish, actually, I was going to say, I wish I could record that and play it too, but I have recorded it. Um, <laughs> it literally play it to, I, I have many new moms sit in the chair across from me. And as you said, as a naturopath in Ontario, I am limited into how I can counsel them. And, but the overwhelming emotion that they have is that of fear, uh, uncertainty and overwhelm because they are caught in the gray zone between very polarized people telling them very black or white information um, probably uninformed information. And they have no, they just say to me, Kara, I don't know what to do. And they're panicked about making the right choice for their child. Um, and if they had someone like you to talk to who is as informed, um, as you are, I, I can literally just, I almost want to cry for them. And I, I, I have so many patients who have just been looking for the answers that you can give, like a rational, informed discussion that's not based on emotion or fear or or irrationality. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. from them, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know, and I, and I, 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 I sympathize. You know, I'm a mother of two small children, and I, I've, and when you see it over and over again, I'm trying to create a model that is lacking. It's, it's, it's a piece that is so needed right now. And, and perhaps, you know, it will change throughout the provinces for naturopathic doctors to really be a safe place to fall and speak to. And so of just, I have patients that simply say to me, thank you for just listening. That's it. I may have not even said much, <laughs> but hearing that from them is just, this is a core area that, that is really needed, and especially in these times, um, because different vaccine mandates are changing, um, you know, increase of vaccines and so forth. So it's like, what should I do? Why should I do it? What's the risk with doing it, with not doing it? How do I get it? And even understanding the infection itself. I have patients walk out understanding, well, you need to understand the infection that you're, you're vaccinating for. I want you to understand that rather than blindly you know, doing things. I want you to understand why you're doing what you're doing because then you're informed. Um, and, and, so, and then moving from there is I would like you to read about the vaccine insert. And so, you know, because people want to know more about the product of Sifine. There There is a vaccine insert available to you online. If you want to look for it, you can read about it. Now I've put it on my, my own website. Um, I have a vaccine section. And within that vaccine section is simply just all of the Canadian um, uh, vaccines that are available because there are a bit different from the US. So we have our own licensed vaccines. We don't have all the vaccines. We only have what's licensed for the country. Um, and then each um, province will do their schedule a little bit different as well. So even if you're moving, um, from one province to another, no, the vaccine schedules are a bit different. You know, here in BC, we do hepatitis B at two, four, and six. Um, other provinces do them in grade six. So those are those differing things. So when I have family from Alberta who they used to do it in grade six and their children are now in grade six, well, they, they are eligible for the hepatitis B vaccine um, here in BC if they haven't had it before. And that would be them because we don't do it in grade six, we do two, four, six uh, months old. So all of those little nuances as well, I think are important. Um, and certainly if you're moving to different states, there's different, there are different uh, schedules. So, yeah. so Dr. Bean, you're, you're creating a psychologically safe, I guess is what you would call it, environment um, to have difficult conversations and, and tough questions which means you're going to get, by creating that environment, you're going to get questions, whereas you may not even get questions from some people, right, who maybe don't mm -hmm. want to, they don't want to ask or question. And there's mm -hmm. something to be said about, you know, that uh, reverence for the old doctor, you know, where it's like, I, you do what the doctor says and all that, but we have to have these tough questions, or at least a, a space to talk about them. Mm 
Yeah. And I think that's absolutely. so important. Do you want to share maybe some of the, like the most common tough questions that you hear? Cause I'm sure that's what people who are listening now are probably thinking of a few questions that they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely some questions that I hear over and over again. And um, it gets quite funny because if I have my third vaccine cons consultation for the day, it's like, did I say this to you already? <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember. I say that often in visits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Like, no, I don't think you did. Okay, great. Um, you know, it's good that you, you say that because I did create my top five vaccine questions, um, which is available on my website front page. You can download that. And, you know, some, one of the common ones is, can you split the MMR up? And you cannot in this country, you cannot. The other countries um, will, may offer just a measles vaccine, for example. Japan does. They ship that to Singapore. Singapore has within their Japanese clinic just the measles vaccine. So it depends. France, I believe, it's a measles rubella, so MR. Um, and, and working with international patients, they're like, oh, well, I'm from France and I'm going to France and therefore that's where I'll do it. So knowing that, uh, you know, countries are different, um, have different things that they offer. In Canada, we do not. Um, I talk a lot about Tylenol. I think it's a really big piece to talk about. Um, people may not realize the, the, the importance of understanding Tylenol and the different things in that which it provides. So the, the common suggestion is to do Tylenol before you get your vaccine to help with the pain and to, to help it and to give it afterwards, also help with the pain and possible fever. Now, in terms of fever, Fever is, is a, uh, an immune response. Some people think that's a bad response. You are going to have an immune response. It's what you're doing. The, the vaccine is creating immune response. Your innate immune system is getting revved up. And so a fever is okay to have. That is, that is a normal reaction or, or, or something that will occur. Um, it's not something that's bad or to be reported. Um, Yes. So with the Tylenol aspect, though, in terms of taking it before or after, what's interesting is some research that's come out is that Tylenol can reduce the effectiveness of the vaccine, the immunogenicity of the vaccine. So I ask people to please stay away from Tylenol. Um, as naturopathic doctors, functional medicine practitioners, integrative practitioners understand also what Tylenol does in terms of reducing and using up our glutathione storages. So I think that's an understanding in the space as well, but more so in terms of efficacy for the vaccine, I ask people not to take Tylenol. And then there is where as a naturopathic doctor, you come in with the beauty of using things that can help with the fever um, to, to maintain that so it doesn't get to, of course, uh, too high. So we can use those aspects in our medicine to help with the fever piece. But um, the Tylenol is a big, big question they should, should not use. Um, but, um, and splitting up vaccines is a big one. So a lot of people ask, can we get singles? Can we do, because you may have friends in the States, they have different vaccines than we do here. And so we only have what is specifically licensed for um, this country. And then each province uses what they, what they use in their timing. So, you know, uh, other provinces will do a five in one at your two, four, six. You change when you do the meninge, meningococcal, uh, meninge C. Um, you know, you can't just isolate pertussis. You never can. The smallest here would be a quad of four in one. Um, and then if they're older, then of course you can do the Tdap. We do not have a Dtap um, available within Canada. In the United States, there is that we don't hear. So it's more about splitting um optimization so i'm about vaccine optimization is what i'm about and how do i optimize the situation the uh, ethic you know the efficacy of the vaccine um because the point of getting a vaccine is to create antibodies period that's the point point. and so what could we be doing that's inhibiting that what are we doing that could could enhance that and probiotics are something that can be helpful in terms of helping with efficacy of the vaccine um, so, and of course, helping even support that immune system as well. So, um, usually it's, it's, those are the, the common themes. Um, you know, sometimes I dive into understanding, um, infant immunity we'll dive into and, in, and in talking about that as well. The, there is suggestion in terms of breastfed mothers, if they should stop 
it's suggested for them to stop breastfeeding because their own antibodies could interfere with the vaccine antigen. Um, so that is a, that is a something for you to decide if you think, you know, stopping breastfeeding, it would be something that you should be doing. Um, especially, you know, if you're someone that's struggling with breastfeeding, I would encourage you to continue. I do think that's a very important aspect. Um, you know, and then we'll talk about passive immunity and, and what could be um, within the mother's breast milk to, to support that baby in those times um, because antibodies are provided for protection. So um, that's sort of the, the main, you know, when I start a vaccine consultations with families, I always start w- wanting to understand what, where each of them are at and to sort of clear the air um, because that's going to be a big, um, you know, that emotional component. Sometimes it's more of a counseling um, consultation than even a vaccine consultation because it's hearing from both sides of where they're at, what they want to do and why they want to do it. And um, so I, I, I like to get that because there is a lot of, um, there can be some conflict between the parents and um, I don't ever want it to go down that road of it being the conflict. So and then we can come to agreement. Um, but yeah. Taylor, you just talked about passive immunity. What, what would you, for someone who doesn't know what passive immunity is, how would you describe what you're talking about there? So passive immunity would be the mother is um, passing on her antibodies to that infection to the baby for protection. So for example, um, when a mother is naturally um, received, you know, contracted measles or naturally contracted pertussis or chicken pox, you create antibodies within your body that are circulating and you, that, those antibodies then circulate through the breast milk and into the baby's body. So if the baby breathes in an antigen, um, then those antibodies are there to help neutralize that antigen. And what's interesting about it, an infant's um, digestive tract is there, uh, the immunity, the secretory IgA is fully developed by three months. So that as well plays a role in that neutralizing those antibodies. But because the infants have, um, they aren't born right off the bat being able to make antibodies to viruses and bacteria, they can make antibodies to food proteins. Um, but because they don't have a robust ability to make antibodies to viruses and bacteria, it's mother's milk that therefore is, is um, taking on that toll and, and protecting the baby from those infections. Um, and it's around six months when you start to reduce the amount of breastfeeding that you're doing that that side of the immune system starts to kick up and that, bo- that baby's body then can start making antibodies uh, more robustly. Uh, to make those on their own antibodies to the viruses and bacteria. And there's a really good uh, paper that comes out, Vaccine Journal, talking about seroconversion, that meaning you take an antigen, can you make an antibody? And seeing that around 9 to 12 months, that infant's body is more robustly capable of doing that, which I find really fascinating um, when you look at the you know, infant immunity in terms of development. is really interesting. Um, and, and that side of the immune system is called TH1, and the side that the body makes antibodies to food proteins is called TH2. And so there's an understanding that there is this locked-in TH2 piece with the infant that they talk about in this paper, um, which, which tells me, okay, well, that's really interesting in terms of timing with vaccines. Um, are we going to get a robust um, efficacy out of that vaccine in terms of timing? And um, because... When vaccines were made for polio and smallpox, the understanding of an, an infant um, immune system isn't as, as we know now. We, that's the beauty of science, the yeah. beauty of be evolving, of understanding things change. We understand things as we keep studying these things. And um, so we just sort of keep on top of it, of, of what's new and uh, cutting edge. So Taylor, um, just on that topic, um, you know, I know here in Canada, vaccines are started at, you know, two, four and six months. Um, In light of that, and actually, it's interesting at your perspective, because you come from Singapore and and Japan, are there other countries that are not starting vaccines as early? If if not, it's earlier. So 
um, Singapore starts at birth, well, they will do hepatitis B and tuberculosis. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and I'm sure other countries start as early as, as birth, but um, two months is pretty much where everyone will start is, is at two months. You know, there's states, they, they do hepatitis B at birth. What's interesting about tuberculosis is that there's some really, um, there's some interesting evidence that tuberculosis can reduce possible adverse reactions to subsequent vaccines. Mm -hmm. And so for my uh, Singapore patients, I make sure they have the tuberculosis done first if they hadn't done it at birth. Um, some people do home births and whatnot, then to do that first and then um, start your other vaccines. So tuberculosis isn't something that's here to worry about. So we don't do the BCG vaccine, but there they do. So um, yeah, at, at, right at birth is where um, some will do, but yeah, two months is, is, the, is pretty much the latest that it's started in um, globally. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the other question that I'm sure our listeners you know, have and I hear, and it's almost um, taboo to even ask this question is, what about injury from vaccines or side effects? Um, because it almost, it, it almost seems like a sin to even ask that that's a possibility, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, that right. is a great question, Kara. Mm -hmm. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> it is, a, and it is a question that comes up. It isn't, it, I say it's not a common question per se, because there's so many more other aspects people are curious about. However, um, do vaccine adverse reactions occur? Yes, they do. I think it would be, um, I need to be diligent about that and, and saying that it is in terms of there, there is a adverse reaction reporting system in place for every single province. And some provinces are mandated and some are not mandated to report. Um, I have the adverse reaction reporting um, three page document in my office that I, I give to patients after I have administered a vaccine to see what adverse reactions potentially to look out for. Um, there is also a table format, three page table format of potential um, side effects that may occur from a vaccine. And, and some you need to monitor for from the day of for seven days and some for 30 to 40 days, more so if you're doing a live viral vaccine. And so those are things to be aware of. And I think um, if we, those that are receiving vaccines are aware of those potential adverse reactions and we know what we should be reporting, and then we have a, a better understanding of what is being reported. All the, the, um, the reports go to a sort of federal level and then are, re are evaluated on an annual basis to see, well, what are the trends that we see? And that was where um, rotavirus was pulled because of intussusception. That's where the wholesale DTAP stopped and went to the acellular form for pertussis um, because there was a wholesale pertussis was creating too much LPS. And so as a result of that, they went to the acellular form. Now there's conversations of, well, the wholesale was more effective um, than the acellular yeah. form. Um, however, there were quite a few reactions that were occurring and therefore it was pulled. Um, so there, there, I, when I administer can we, a vaccine- Can we just, uh, Taylor, sure. can you just explain a couple, you said a couple of things that we may know what you mean, but maybe other people don't know. Uh, so LPS and how important LPS might be. You said that the whole cell pertussis, I believe it was, can yep. cause a really uh, strong LPS mediated response. Is that correct? Right. So the the Bordetella pertussis um, will cause for this, um, which is the vaccine for whooping cough. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. For the whooping yeah. cough. Yes. Yeah. Um, will cause for this release of LPS, so lipopolysaccharides, which are really inflammatory. And, you know, we have gut bacteria that, that release LPS, lipopolysaccharides as well, and they can be quite um, inflammatory and damaging. And that is what that portion of the vaccine was doing. So recognizing that there was an uptick of, of LPS due to the wholesale pertussis, then they, they created an acellular form and therefore that reduced um, the, the LPS within the body, which was quite inflammatory. And so reactions were happening as a result of that. Um, and what's interesting on the LPS front, in, because you can contract, you can, a lot of people still contract uh, pertussis, whooping cough, 
Board of Telepertussis is that the LPS piece, um, a plug for, you know, NDs across the country is, and, and for listeners is to look at taking um, spore-based probiotics because that can be really good in terms of reduction of the LPS part. Um, so that's something that I want to implement even in my talks is thinking about more spore-based probiotics for the LPS aspect, even if you naturally contract uh, pertussis because pertussis is, is amongst us. Um, yeah. Did that answer that question? Yeah, that's yeah. helpful. So you're saying okay. that okay. the spore-based probiotics can mediate or sort of mitigate maybe the, the strength or severity of the LPS. Which yeah. Is probably, that, and is the LPS necessary for the reaction, right? Is it necessary for the reaction? No, it's just part of what was happening. Um, and we want to mitigate, reduce that LPS. And so knowing okay. that that's why people were having such a poor reaction to the DTaP vaccine, they went to an acellular form. Okay. That's an interesting concept because, you know, what is better? Is it, is it whole cell, uh, the, the whole cell one that is causing more reactions, but actually gives better immunity mm -hmm. or the vaccine that gives less reactions, but is actually not great immunity. Right. Right. So there's that. And that's the conversation to have too. I mean, perhaps timing of the vaccine would help for better efficacy. The CDC um, puts together a surveillance report. They, so if you go to CDC, you can put in um, pertussis surveillance report and it'll, it'll come up with a really nice PDF of each year looking at the cases of pertussis within the country and, and through state. And then they put it from six months to 11 months and they have age categories. Um, 2008, I believe it was, I think there was five deaths, I think. Um, but anyways, they, they, they put in categories of, they don't know the vaccine status, unvaccinated, partially vaccinated, and fully vaccinated. And they put the numbers in there. And each year, it looks about 50% of those that contracted pertussis were vaccinated, partial or full. Um, and so just to put the light on terms of, okay, we've been vaccinated, therefore I will never get the infection. And that's, I, I, that's a one part I feel that people when they come in to talk to me is if they get the vaccine, it's almost like they're protected from almost everything. Um, I'm not sure where that comes from because it is, obviously the vaccine is to help protect you against that one infection, but you still have the potential of contracting the infection even with having the vaccine. However, your symptoms most likely will be less. Now you can still therefore transmit the infection. And I think this COVID time is really, um, there's aspects of this COVID time that teach us things that we have known about spreading of infections mm -hmm. forever. And that the social distancing is important even if you want to implement in terms if there's a measles um, outbreak, or if we know there's a pertussis outbreak, is those respiratory droplets that will spread the infection, and we can treat it for other infections in the future, perhaps. But you, I as, had, as uh, a, sorry, I interrupted you. There. I was going yeah, to yeah. say I I had uh, whooping cough or pertussis in grade seven, and I remember as a twelve year old coughing in my bed, thinking I was going to die. Like I mm. I literally, and I was fully vaccinated on schedule, very, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, that, uh, I, I vividly remember thinking, I'm not going to live through this cough. Like, yeah. It, yeah. Horrible. It isn't good. And, and I think that, you know, that is where the beauty of naturopathic medicine comes in, in terms of helping the body and, um, through these aspects. Now by, by offering vaccines, um, with, in terms of surveillance of infections, I have the vials here to swab for if I think it's pertussis, if I think it's Hib, um, because I think, you know, if we could level up a little bit in terms of what is happening in our community at any one time to know what is occurring. And so you have a cough, it could be anything. It, you know, it could be, um, you know, a vaccine infection. Um, it could be something not correlated at all that you could get a vaccine for. But then we know obviously how better to treat it if it's viral or if it's bacterial, what we need to hone in on. So um, the, the surveillance reporting from, we don't have that um, 
in that detail, as far as I'm aware here in BC or anywhere in Canada, in terms of those surveillance reports of knowing, well, the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated. Now, that did occur with measles. Um, of, of We had 29 cases here and seeing that 64% of them had received one, if not two, MMR vaccines. So we see, but when was it? And so that's where I have implemented more tighter testing with people to see what is your immunity for you know, measles, monster bell, and chicken pox, because I can test those right now. And does that mean you do need a vaccine as a result of, of having that, that um, poor response in terms of titers, meaning immunity to that infection, meaning you've seen it in the past and you've created antibodies to it. We do that when we're pregnant, we check for rubella and hep B to see if you have immunity to those infections or not. Um, so I've been doing that more and I'm, I'm actually trying to create um, a bank of information for myself in terms of when the vaccine was given and what are their immunity is now in terms of titer testing. Now, caveat for titer testing though is it there can be a lot of false negatives. Um, and so that is the unfortunate part of titer testing is that it isn't 100% proof um, telling me everything, but it is a guideline that we can at least try and use because it's what we have. And um, so I, I, I do that, you know, I do, th do that for children. I think titer testing is important. Some may disagree with me, but I do think it is important. And so I have families who are up for their, their child's kindergarten MMR shots, and um, we will check to see what their titers are um, for them. And, um, you know, did you have your vaccine in the past? When was your last vaccine? And I'm not sure. So we can check and see, um, and that's available to you. So well, you're just um, mitigating risk, which is just so good. That's part of good medicine, I think. Like we had a, little, a brief little chat about the kind of you know errors in medicine, which are errors of doing things that we that something could go wrong, and errors of not doing things where something can go wrong or can happen from not doing something. So I think it's just great because you're you're mitigating risk when you look at the titers. And you know, back to what you're saying about <clears throat> you know it's not always perfect. Well, like I, I'm yet to find anything perfect in medicine uh you know we have a huge belief that they're quite reliable and they I, you know they're a heck of a lot more reliable than they're not but you know we don't know everything for sure all the time and that, that uncertainty is something that we have to get a little bit more okay with i think and covid has helped mm -hmm. um hammer that home is that there is uncertainty and there there are things that are going to happen and and uh that sort of is maybe a good tie-in to like you know doing every everything we can to to maintain our basic sort of foundations of health. And then I was gonna ask you like, what is your uh, expert or expertise in terms of uh, administering vaccines in someone who you would generally call quite healthy versus someone who, you, who may not be very healthy? If you can even comment on that. Well, you know, being healthy on the day of the vaccine is the best case scenario. I want that innate immune system to be able to respond um, to that vaccine when upon injection. And the, you know, when you're healthy, first off, we look at, you know, what's your risk profile for the infection? We talk about risks. And then, you know, the risks are quite high. So let's do vaccine. I do want a, a healthier person to receive the vaccine for better efficacy of the vaccine. Now, do we know if vaccine have, have worked upon that person? The only way of knowing would be to do a titer test. Did they respond? And what's interesting is there are primary non-seroconverters amongst us. There are people that do not respond well. They don't, their seroconversion is very poor. And that always fascinates me. Well, what is the immunity of our community at any one time? Do we know? Mm -hmm. How do we know? Do we know the vaccine worked? Well, how do you know the vaccine worked? How do you, can, can you tell? I mean, I have all these questions that go in my own mind of, but you know, and, and this is where, of course the conversation, this is where the fear or um, people vaccinate for social pressures because a family will say, you can't visit me unless your infant is vaccinated. Um, or you can't visit me with your children because I have an infant. And so your children need to be vaccinated. This happens a, a lot. And so, I always want to think to myself, and I ask the patient, well, is the mother vaccinated or is the father that goes out and comes home who works with so many people, is he vaccinated? Or what is his immunity um, to these things? Because the, the two-year-old that's coming over um, 
is no more of a risk than me as a parent coming over or you or your husband coming over from being out. And so he can be asymptomatic carrier, which we've learned with COVID, can be asymptomatic carrier of this infection and still spread it. Hence, um, you know, this two week mandatory close everything down. So we can really apply what we're learning now to all infections. Um, so yes, being healthy is best. Um, if you're, if you know, you've got a gastrointestinal infection, if you've really got an upper respiratory tract infection, I do want to have you healthier before you have your vaccine so that your innate immune system is going to respond better for a better efficacy of that vaccine. Um, no, there is there studies of, of, of looking at this? No. Vaccine efficacy studies and safety studies are done on healthy people. That's who's used in these clinical trials. Not unhealthy, sickly people. If they are, they drop out. So that's where I need to, well, if you're healthy, I know what will happen because of what those studies have shown me. But if you're unhealthy, um, that's hard to know, even though, yes, you can get the vaccine. However, will you have a great response and longevity from it? Taylor, what's the main elements of uh, consent that you're looking for when, you want, when you're going to uh, administer a vaccine? What are the most important elements of consent that you're really looking for from, uh, to deliver to the person who's uh, you know, getting this intervention? So through the BCCDC, there is a seven part process to achieve informed consent. And so, you know, essentially it's, can I administer this vaccine? Can I poke a needle in your arm? Um, yes. But then you want them to understand the risk benefit ratio of doing the vaccine and not doing the vaccine and having a clear understanding of that. Um, and then, you know, if there is any adverse reactions, what those would be. Um, and, and so that's, a, and then of course, allowing them to ask questions is part of the, of the seven step process. Number five of um, asking questions is part of getting informed consent and, and, and whatnot. So those are, that's really what it'll embody um, is, is your risk profiles, your risk if you don't have it, the understanding the infection, if you, if you do have the, the vaccine, this is what it's to protect you for. Um, these are the potential adverse reactions, which some of them are quite rare, um, but to, to note of, um, because if you know and it is occurring, then I and you as a naturopathic doctor, well, we can treat if you're presenting with you know, um, per protitis, if you're, if you're presenting with a rash, you've got a heightened immune system. Okay. We're going to support you through that. Um, all while trying really not to use Tylenol in the process. So, um, that's really what it embody when I am giving a vaccine. If, if you want a vaccine with me, then I, you have to do a 30 minute consultation with me. We go through all these things. Um, and then, um, then the, then the next time you're in, we do the vaccine because I need to go get it. Um, and then I, I will do one hour consultations with people to really hash out, um, all these questions that they have. And I will get two to three pages of questions from people, um, that have a lot of, you know, curiosity around this. And so, and some people just have, you know, two or three. So depends what frame of mind you're coming from, your interest level of, of you know, I let you um, navigate the conversation and um, I'm here to, to answer them. Um, I, what are some of the, um, just a, a last question here. I'm just, because there are probably still listeners who are, you know, perhaps on the fence of vac about vaccines and, you know, wish they had someone <laughs> to bring their two page to questions to um, maybe we can hit like what are for those ones who are coming in in a kind of a state of of maybe fear about the vaccine um, what are some of those thing questions that you get um, that maybe you can I, I don't know if there's a quick answer to them but yeah what are the most common questions you get on those pages well people want to know what's in a vaccine and you know a lot of people will will talk about you know well there's formaldehyde and that's you know in there and, and yes there is formaldehyde what's interesting is our own body makes formaldehyde um and they it is in there and so people want to know what's in there and why it's in there mm -hmm. um people will say um 
you know, there's thimerosal in all the vaccines. There is not thimerosal in all the vaccines, or there's aluminum in all the vaccines, and there's not aluminum in all vaccines. And why is aluminum there? Well, it's an adjuvant. It stimulates the immune system. That is the point of the aluminum. Could there be a different adjuvant that could be used? Potentially, um, but that's the one that was discovered and used, and it stimulates that immune response. And so um, I do like to demystify, or not demystify, but more so get on common ground of the difference between oral aluminum and adjuvant aluminum. Those are those you're comparing apples and oranges, and people think they're exactly the same thing, and they are not. Um, you will get more aluminum in, you know baby formula than within a vaccine, but understand that, you know, what Medscape will even tell you is that the aluminum that you, you absorb is 0.1 to 0.3% of that. Very little. It's a lot more, but you absorb very little of it. Um, and so those kind of nuances of understanding and being, you know, confirmed and understanding that aspect, you know, and then with aluminum, um, yes, in vaccines, what's really interesting is, is uh, taking uh, silica water, that's in time that will help bind that aluminum to pull it back out after it's done its job. And so, you know, Fiji water mm. is something that people are drinking more of because it's a high content of that silicate, silica water um, percentage. And so that's something of having that understanding and awareness, like, okay, well, that, that's something I can do afterwards and I continue taking that. So um, those are fear-based, will be around what's in a vaccine, what will happen um, afterwards, what am I looking for? How do I mitigate that? Um, I don't understand why I'm doing this vaccine. Let's understand the infection. Then this is why you're doing it. What are your risks? Um, how do you contract these things? You know, those kind of questions, um, because people like, I don't understand and why am I doing this? And so therefore we can go through this This is why you're doing it. This is where mm -hmm. you get it. This is, this is the longevity. Yes, you know, things like um, Hib has reduced and, and pneumococcal has reduced since the vaccine came in, um, you know, and so there are things that did reduce before vaccines came in. There's things that have reduced because vaccines came in. So that transparency in the conversation as well. Um, yeah, so those are those are things we talk about. And I think, and I mean, that's really no different than any other area of medicine. It's just such a fully charged topic, right? Like, as you said, you know, when we were chatting in our green room before, it's like, you know, if you're going to have a colonoscopy, you want to know what the risk benefit is, right? You mm -hmm. want to know what the potential side effects are, what mm -hmm. to expect from the procedure, what the possible outcomes are, what the benefit is of having the colonoscopy, what information that can give us. Um, What's the risk of not having it? Yeah. <clears throat> like I have a, I, was, I have my sheet here of what I, I go through with everyone with just the uh, sort of safe interventions that I do as a, as a naturopath in Ontario. And it's, I have here, I understand the assessment and rationale for the treatments discussed above. I understand the expected benefits of the treatments discussed above. I'm aware of possible side effects of the treatments discussed above. I'm aware of the risks of not treating the above, i.e. conditions that may remain status quo or progress and alternative treatments or approaches if applicable have been discussed. And I mean, it's really, it seems onerous when I do it with people after like just doing, you know, some uh, visceral manipulation or acupuncture or fairly safe uh, interventions, but I just think it's it's a way to really um, honor the the power and, and everything of the patient in making the discussion um, open and, and really creating a space for it. So yeah, it adds a bit of time and everything, but I mean, I think it's extra applicable for what you're doing and that's why it's really refreshing to hear that you're having like a 30 minute consult. And then the way you're set up is actually kind of interesting that you you don't, you have the discussion and then you actually don't you don't act on the decision that day. It's very interesting because um, that might be that might lead to healthier decisions if people don't feel sort of forced by time and space to have that to make that decision immediately. Um, I think it makes for a bit of reflection and and everything um, with the decision. I just I just I'm pretty mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. this. Talk. I just think it's so important to have this uh, this talk with you, Taylor. And I I. Uh, yeah, top, you, you were like top of the list, one of the top of the list. Well, we got another one top of the list coming up. We're going to talk to Dr. Dr. Paul Anderson coming up. So, 
Well, he's the king. He is. <laughs> he is the king. I call him <laughs> Uncle Grandpa Paul. Yeah. Yeah, yes. we talked to him on Monday. We're we're hoping to pull the rug and switch the topic to COVID. So yes, which he well, could totally he, jam yeah. on a no problem. I'm sure. Well, <laughs> yeah. he has a he has an incredible uh, webinar that's happening tonight uh, around that. So yeah, yeah, I um. I appreciate you allowing me to come on here and speak about something that I've become very passionate about. Um, I, I'm trying to reduce fear and anxiety and anger one patient at a time and trying to spread that. We need to be rational, logical, um, take a deep breath and let's talk about this. And I am will, I am whatever you decide to do. I'm here to support you. I'm not here to shame you. Um, and you should never be shamed for your decision. It is ultimately your decision and your child. This is a public health discussion. I, I'm fully aware of that. This is, however, you need to make a decision based on your family for your own child and your own health. Because, you know, if there is something that occurs afterwards, you're responsible for dealing with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so you need to take all responsibility for the choices that you make. So we need to have that informed decision, that informed consent. Um, and I think when we don't, then we will create hesitancy. Mm -hmm. Which, which I think it's such a, it's such a beautiful model. I think if we could, you know, no matter who's administering vaccines, whether it's a naturopath or public health or your, or your family practitioner, um, if we could uh, approach this topic in this manner, I think everyone would be more protected, probably more vaccinated and, and vaccinated without fear mm -hmm. um, and able to make a choice that felt right for them and their family and, and their kids. So um, thank you so much for this, uh, this awesome informed and rational conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do we find you? Because I'm hoping a lot of our patients um, will uh, will want to talk to you further. So I know you have on your website, drtaylorbean.com, your top five vaccine questions that you can uh, download. And um, you do do um, virtual vaccine consultations. Is that correct? Yes. So I will do, um, yes, I do virtual, virtual um, consultations. They're more so just me answering all of your questions. And if there is something I feel that you need to further do, um, be it a probiotic or whatnot or vitamin D, then I will send you back to your, your naturopathic doctor and you can, you can work with them on dosage products and so forth. I'm just a portal of what I've learned, what I understand to help you. And then you can see your ND in Ontario, Manitoba, wherever you are, um, and to further with the, the treatment piece, which I don't, I don't do. So um, yeah, so on the website is, you know, to download that, you know, somewhere to start. So it, I have got um, the, the references to, to talk about in terms of the Tylenol, the probiotics I have a reference there that you can download and read. And then um, I've started my thriving immunity for kids. And so this is a community that I really want to start building. Um, you can join the community. It's, I'm just launching this. And so then I can start sending out little tidbits on um, supporting the immune system um, right now is a good time and you know you know going forward um, and I'll even plug in a little bit of vaccine information within that so those that are interested in immunity um, your you know for your children and for you um, and around vaccines and that's the community that I, I um, invite you to join um, and on my website you can find me I'm at two different locations I'm in British Columbia um, and you can, you can book either of those and um, we can do a, a, yeah, a vaccine consultation from wherever you are. Fantastic. So once again, it's Dr. Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R-B-E-A-N.com. Awesome. And also Instagram. I'm uh, on Instagram as well. So sometimes it's easier to see what's happening. That's uh, Dr. Taylor Bean dot ND. Um, you can find me on there and um, I like to post things about things that I'm helping with my own children, things that I'm using um, that are supporting their own immune system, um, things that are happening, places that I'm speaking that you could potentially come to listen and um, just staying connected that way. Super. Well, thank you so much for bravely going where a few NDs have dared to go. I really <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, 
Exactly. Thanks so much. And maybe we'll have you back on to talk about uh, kids immunity. I think that's an awesome topic that we could perfect uh, dedicate another podcast if you will chat to us again. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Anytime. All right. Thanks, Dr. Beam. We'll talk to you soon then. Thank Sounds you. Good. Bye. Bye. Bye.